Hi folks, this is uh, Jason. Um, I'm officially off YouTube, but I'll I'll be making these videos and then putting them on private and won't be releasing them uh, for a few months. So if anybody does see these before the prior time, these are not for public consumption until a later date. It's good to be with you. And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your grace. And we give you the praise. And we give you the glory. And we give you the honor. And we thank you for this day. And we pray for your blessings, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to be looking at a number of scholarly issues. And the first thing that we're going to be looking at uh, concerning the four Gospels is the historical literary evidence of the authorship of the four Gospels. Um, so we're going to be thinking about how do we know that the four Gospels were written by the people that we believe them to have been written by. What evidence is there to trace back the authorship? And it's important to bear in mind that if we can't answer this question, it will lead to a considerable amount of problems. If we can't trace back the four Gospels back to uh, the original authors, it's going to be a pretty devastating blow against Christianity. Because the Gospels are the main source about who Jesus is. But if we can prove the authorship of the Gospels, it gives the Gospels a certain amount of authority showing that these documents are written by the people who wrote them um, and that the material that they've written is concerning what they see as important, i.e. the eyewitness accounts. So it's very important also that we get a lot of Muslim scholars, Muslims, and also uh, agnostic scholars and atheists who will attack uh, the four Gospels. And one of the areas is to try and say that there were these conspiracies in the early church to suppress other Gospels, etc. So if we can give strong historical evidence for the uh, authorship of the Gospels, then that pretty much destroys the critics' arguments concerning conspiracy theories. So first of all, what evidence do we have? Well, Origen, um, an early church father from 25 AD, writes this. Concerning the four Gospels, which alone are uncontroverted in the Church of God under heaven, I have learned by tradition that the Gospel according to Matthew, who was at one time a publican, I have learned by tradition that the Gospel according to Matthew, who was at one time a publican and afterwards an apostle of Jesus Christ, was written first and that he composed it in the Hebrew tongue and published it for the converts from Judaism. The second written was that according to Mark, who wrote it according to the instruction of Peter, who in his general epistle acknowledged him as a son, saying, The church that is in Babylon, elect to get to, together with you, salute you, and so does Mark, my son. And third was that according to Luke, the gospel composed by Paul, which he composed of for the converts from the Gentiles, most of all that according to John. This uh, quotation is in uh, Origins commentary on Matthew. Now this is a very significant piece of historical information from an early church father that there was no controversy concerning who wrote those Gospels. Now if you know anything about uh, history and how to verify ancient documents you will know that this is uh, strong evidence. Those who don't know that you need to know that this is because you you you're getting uh, a very clear statement uh, from a very eminent thinker 
who's not going to be lying, who's not going to be twisting things, and it's significant information, but it gets even better. Tertullian, who was perhaps if not one of the greatest theologians in the history of the church, uh, in 207 AD, in his book Against Marcion, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, says this, The same authority of the apostolic churches will afford evidence to the other Gospels also, which we possess equally through their means, and according to their usage, I mean the Gospels of John and Matthew, whilst that which Mark published may be affirmed to be Peter's, whose interpreter Mark was. But even Luke's form of the Gospel men usually ascribed to Paul, and it may well seem that the works which disciples publish belong to their masters. That's very clear evidence of who the authors of the four Gospels are. Tertullian 207 AD says, we lay it down as our first position that the Evangelical Testament as apostles for its authors, to whom was assigned by the Lord in Himself, his office of publishing the gospel of the apostles. Therefore, John and, and Matthew first instilled faith into us, while as apostolic men, Luke and Mark, renew it afterwards. These all start with the same principles of faith, so far as relates to the one and only God, the creator of his Christ, how that he was born of the Virgin and king, came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Against Marcion 4.2. By 180 AD, we have Irenaeus says, an early church father says, Matthias also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Luke also the companion. In Paul recorded in the book the gospel preached by him, after which John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence to defeat Ephesus in Asia against heresies 3 1 1. <laughs> then we have the moratorium fragment uh, from 175 to 200 AD. Uh, from the moratorium fragment, um, we read this, these words. The third book of the Gospel, that according to Luke, the well-known physician, Luke wrote in his own name in order after the ascension of Christ, when Paul had associated with him himself as one studious of right, nor did he himself see the Lord in the flesh, and he, according as he was able to accomplish it, began his narrative with the nativity of John. The fourth Gospel is that of John, one of the disciples, when his fellow disciples and bishops entreated him, he said, Fash ye now with me for the space of three days, and let us recount of each other what may be revealed to each other. On the same night it was revealed to Andrew, one of the apostles, that John should narrate all things in his own name, as they called them to mind. Uh, and you could go on, there's more about, but uh, scholars will tell you that even though two of the Gospels have mentioned um, Luke and John, it says the third book, the fourth Gospel, and we've only had partial fragments of this document, and so it's a, very clear that you conclude there would have been a first and a second book, and uh, so we have uh, the fragment missing concerning Mark and Matthew. But again, this is very strong historical evidence for the authorship of the four Gospels, because here it's mentioning um, the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Luke. Then we have uh, 165 to 180 AD, the Diatessaron. This is a harmony of the four Gospels, a very important piece of information. Uh, in the Diatessaron, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, it quotes John 1, 1, 5. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, and God is the Word. This was in the beginning with God. Everything was by his hand, without him not even one existing thing was made. In him was life, 
and the life is the light of man, and the light shineth in the darkness. The Diatessaron in chapter 2, 1 to 8, quotes Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. It says, Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was on this wise, at the time when his mother was given in marriage to Joseph. Before they came together, she married with child of the Holy Spirit, and Joseph, her husband, was a just man, and did not wish to expose her, and he proposed to put her away secretly. But when he thought of this, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, and said unto him, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take Mary thy wife, for that which is begotten in her is of the Holy Spirit. She shall bear a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. All this was that saying from the Lord by the prophet might be fulfilled. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted with us is our God. When Joseph arose from his sleep, it is as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took his wife, and he were not, until she brought forth her firstborn. Diatassaron chapter 2 verse 9 to 28 quotes Luke chapter 2 verse 1 to 20. And in those days there went from a decree of Caesar that all the people of his dominion should be enrolled. The first enrollment was while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and every man went to be enrolled in the city. And Joseph went up from Nazareth, a city of Galilee, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. It was, for he was the house of David and of his tribe with Mary's betrothed she being with child to be enrolled there and while she was three days for her being delivered the accomplice and she brought forth her firstborn son she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them where they were staying and you could read more there and the diatessaron in 7 9 quotes Mark chapter 2 verse 14 and when he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting among the tax gatherers. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. So what you see here is quite clearly um, historical evidence from the diatessaron of the authorship of the four Gospels that they were in circulation prior to 165 AD but then we have more evidence in 150 AD Justin Martyr quotes um, and gives us some important information concerning the Gospels and quotes the Gospels he says for the Apostles in the memoirs composed by them which are called Gospels have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them there follows the institution of the Lord's Supper, First Apology 66. On the day called Sunday, all who live in cities in the country gather together to one place. The memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long time permits. Then the reader has ceased. The president verbally instructs and exhorts the Im imitation of these good things. First Apology 67. Just in quotes from other texts, uh, for example. Matthew chapter eleven twenty seven. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. To those the Son chooses to reveal him. Uh, just in quoting Mark three seventeen, James son of Zebedee and his brother John. To them he gave name Bonarges, which means sons of thunder. Uh, just in also gives us. Uh, quotations from Luke in Luke 22:44, he quotes and being in anguish he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground so Justin Martyr tells us what the early church was doing with the Gospels but also tells us information about quotations from the Gospels we even have more information in 130 AD we have a fragment in John Ryland's library um, of John 18 verse 31-33 he says Pilate said to them take him and judge him according to your law uh, this fragment apparently uh, I think 
recent scholarship dates it to uh, the first century. Uh, then in we have Papias in 120 to 130 AD, perhaps 120. Um, this is given in Eusebius Papias says, so then Matthew wrote the oracles in the Hebrew language and everyone interpreted them as he was able. Eusebius Church History 339-16 Papias 120 also in his is quoted in church history as Eusebius 339 and 15 we read Mark having become an interpreter of Peter wrote down accurately though not in order whatsoever he remembered of the things said of are done by Christ for he neither heard the Lord nor followed him but afterwards as I said he followed Peter who adapted his teaching to the needs of his hearers but with no intention of giving a connected account of the Lord's discourse so that Mark committed no error while he thus wrote some things as he remembered them for he was careful for one thing not to omit any of the things which he had heard and not to state any of them falsely so we were already very very clearly got early uh, strong historical material to show that the Gospels uh, were in circulation in the first century because we're quoting second century writers which implies that these texts come from the first century and we can trace who wrote them and that they were significant in the early church. Uh, 130 AD the letter of Barnabas gives a clear uh, gives a quotation of Matthew. Um, we have the Dedicate in 100 105 AD gives a quotation of Matthew. We read in uh, Didache chapter 8 verse 2 he quotes Matthew 6 5 and do not pray as the hypocrites as, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel pray thus our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name etc. So strong historical attestation there of the, uh, the early gospels and um, anybody trying to de debunk that information that I'll give you uh, would utterly fail. It's just based on solid, very, very solid uh, scholarship. And uh, so it would be very foolish to for anybody trying to debunk that information. And you can easily debunk the skeptics by going to the church fathers and finding the comments and quotations that they make. So that's the um, evidences of um, of the authorship. Um, now I just want to reflect a little bit on the origin of the Gospels. Uh, how do we know for sure that um, that we have the uh, these gospels from these ancient writers? How do we know for sure? Well, let's just go back a little bit to Tertullian. Tertullian says. The same authority of the apostolic churches, this is the early church father in 200 AD, the same authority of the apostolic churches will afford evidence to the other gospels also, which we possess equally 
through their means and according to the usage. I mean the Gospels of John and Matthew, while that which Mark published may be affirmed to be Peter's, whose interpreter was Mark, for even Luke's form of the Gospel men usually ascribe to Paul, and it may well seem that the works which disciples publish belong to their masters. Well then, Marcion ought to be called to a strict account concerning these other Gospels also for having omitted them and insisted in preference on Luke as if they too had not had free course of the churches as well as Luke's gospel from the beginning nay it is even more credible that they existed from the very beginning for being the work of the apostles they were prior and contemporary in origin with the churches themselves um, So Tertullian kind of like basically nails it on the head for us really. I mean that's solid historical information to to trace the four gospels to their authors. Um, now people will say well why don't we have the names on original text? Um, well, People don't realize what was happening in the first century concerning publication. In the area of publication in the first century, an author wouldn't act the way an author acts today. If you publish a book today, what will happen is a publisher will print it for you. Um, and it will have your title and your name within the book, etc. But uh, the, that was completely different in the first century, if you were publishing a book, what would happen is you would be the sole, sole controller of that book. That would be the first thing. So what you would do, you would finance yourself copies of your book, and then you would encourage people to make copies of that. All the time, you would be in control of the process. And then when copies of the copies have made, it would be seen to have gone public. Also, in the act of reading in public, in community, that would also be seen as act of publishing. On top of this, um, you could have individuals copy the work, which you would donate a copy to one of the major libraries, and people could copy your book freely. There was also um, people who were wealthy would take on the financing of the copying of your book. So that was the kind of culture in the first century in the, in the first century. But here's some more important information. When a book was published there would be um, right at the bottom there would be a um, information about the title but also there would be a piece of paper attached to the scroll in order to identify who the author was. These two pieces of information would often be lost in, in or through wear and tear but this didn't hinder people knowing who the author was because at the beginning people clearly knew through these tags who the writers were. So that's why we don't have original manuscripts with, or er, the earliest manuscripts with the actual insignia of the title and the names of the authors. Um, because these tags uh, that were put on as markers within the documents would have been lost. Uh, you can see that this is uh, historically verifiable. In the time of Pompeii, uh, when the eruption happened, there were certain towns that were covered with ash. And we've uncovered from one particular town a whole library of books that came from the first century. And we found that they have these tags on uh, of the the authors etc so we know that this is correct 
about the way authorship was done in the first century. What does this all mean? What this means is this, is that we know for sure that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John wrote those books. We know for sure because of the way publishing was conducted in those times. Just because sometimes um, we don't have the actual uh, clips that state the authors uh, uh, and the title of the book absolutely does not negate the fact that that would have been the case and that a book would have been produced and moved forward in, in antiquity uh, and seen and, and being absolutely clear who the author was because of the way they published their works. So that means when you understand the publishing culture of that time, we can say for sure that when we look at the historical evidence of a Tertullian and, and others, that this is reliable information about the tradition of the passing on of the text of the name of the author. It might seem complex to you what I've said, but believe you me, uh, what I'm telling you is, is brilliant scholarship that you can get from if you type in uh, libraries of Pompeii and look at the scholars that have researched papyri and how publishing was conducted in the first century and we can find a, a whole stack of information from how literary works were preserved in the uh, eruption, uh, volcanic eruption in the time of Pompeii. I hope that was a help to you and um, sorry So I think what we'll do now is um, just think about the uh, genre of the um, of the text. What kind of literary text are the Gospels? Uh, Here is what um, Craig Keener says in his um, writing. He says, through most of history, readers understood the Gospels as biographies. But after 1915, scholars tried to find some other classification for them, mainly because these scholars confused ancient and modern biography and noticed that the Gospels differed from the later, the current trend. However, is again to recognize the Gospels as ancient biographies. Richard Burridge, a, a dean of King's College London, states, traditionally the Gospels were viewed as biographies of Jesus, though they were used as windows on, onto Jesus, written for those who wanted to know about him. Even with the development of literary and historical critical studies, the quest for the historical Jesus still uses the Gospels as a basis to discover information about Jesus' life, teaching and death. During the 19th century, biographies began to explain the character of a great person by considering his or her up upbringing, formative years, school and psychological development and so on. The Gospels began to look, look unlike such biographies. During the 1920s, Scholars like Carl Ludwig Schmidt and Rudolf Bultmann rejected any notion that the Gospels were biographies. 
The Gospels appear to have no interest in Jesus' human personality, appearance or character, nor do they tell us anything about the rest of his life, other than his brief public ministry and extended concentration on his death. Instead, the Gospels were seen as popular folk literature, collections of stories handed down orally over time. Far from being biographies of Jesus, the Gospels were unique forms of literature, sui generis, and this approach dominated God studies for the next half century or so. What does this mean? Well, basically, uh, modern scholarship uh, at the turn of the 20th century um, basically saw the Gospels not as biography, but as just uh, mythological kind of literature. But things massively changed. And uh, Burridge writes, in recent years, many genres have been proposed for the Gospels, but increasingly they have been again seen as biography. The words of Charles, the works of Charles Talbot and David Orne, has contributed greatly to this development. While my own work has attempted to give a detailed argument combining literary literary theory and classical studies with the Gospel. scholarship. And Burridge gives some arguments as to why he believes that these Gospels are biography. He writes, if we compare the Synoptic Gospels with our biography, we know that Matthew goes straight into the subject ancestry like Nepos and Plutarch. Mark, however, like Exophon, begins with just one sentence, while some of Plutarch's lives start straight in Timoleon 1. Luke's use of preface can be paralleled in Lucian and Philo, with a paragraph each in uh, Isocrates, Tacitus, and Philostratus, who all have a more extended prologue. Thus, the various beginnings of the Synoptic Gospels reflect the range of possibilities for biography with respect to an opening sentence or preface. Also, like most Grecian Roman biographies, Mark and Matthew include the name of their subject at the very start. Okay. Uh, Burridge also mentions about the Gospel of John, fits Grecian Roman biography. He writes, The other common opening features of biography is an early use of the subject's name. Here, the word comprises the fourth and fifth word, which is then identified with Jesus Christ, the first mention of Jesus' name at the end of the prologue. Our attention is next drawn to the Baptist denial of being the Christ, witness instead to Jesus. Thus, although Jesus' actual name is not part of the immediate opening words, he is clearly identified as the subject of the prologue, and his name and messianic identity commence the text itself after the prologue, the use of the name after the prologue was noted as common feature in biographies such as the Agricola. And then one more issue about chronology, how the four Gospels mirror Greco-Roman biographies and the area of chronology. Burridge on Matthew, Mark and Luke says, All three synoptic Gospels begin the main narrative with baptism of Jesus by John, although it is prefaced by birth stories in Matthew and Luke. All three conclude with the passion story, Jesus' death, and subsequent events. In between the baptism and the passion, all three Gospels include a large amount of material concerned with Jesus' ministry. Our analysis of the content of the Synoptic Gospels show that the narrative appears as a chronological count, unfolding the passion to the passion by Jesus' ministry with his popular success and official opposition. Also, all three have geographical progression from ministry in Galilee to Jerusalem, most clearly marked in Luke account. Um, we could go on. Um,
Uh, if you want to find out more about the uh, genre of the uh, of the Gospels, I would encourage you to read Richard Burridge, "What Are the Gospels?" for more uh, succinct. The point is the new scholarship that's recently come out is by um, Burridge and others shows us that the Gospels are actually mirroring Greco-Roman uh, biography which was heavily trying to do history based on eyewitness material and so the new research um, confirms that that's the significance of what we're saying okay Okay, so why are the Gospels significant and important? Why are they authoritative? I think the answer to that has to be that the Apostles who were behind the production of these Gospels were given authority by Jesus, first of all. If you read Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 19, and he says, And he went up to a mountain called and called to him whom he wanted. They came to him, and he appointed the twelve whom he named apostles, that they should be with him, that he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, whom he surnamed Peter, James the son of Zebedee, John the brother of James, whom he surnamed Menages, which is the son of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, also betrayed him. So... They had authority, and then they were given the task of being eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. So in Luke 24, 36 to 43, we see how the apostles were key to being eyewitnesses of Jesus. It says as in Luke 24, 36 to 43, and as they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were terrified and frightened, supposed that they were seeing a spirit, and he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, what it is, it, it is myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they did not yet believe it, because of joy and wondering, he said to them, Have you any food here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. The first account I made of Theophilus of that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he had through the Holy Spirit given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen by them over 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. So, from scripture there we see that the apostles had the authority mm -hmm. to, uh, to give um, a testimony of the resurrection. Now what the early church fathers say is that they had that authority. In Clement, an early church father uh, writes, the apostles have preached the gospel to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has done so from God. Christ therefore was sent forth by God and the apostles by Christ. 1 Clement 42. Ignatius 105. Uh, in his Magnesians 13, study therefore to be established in the doctrine of the Lord and the Apostles. Polycarp 117, let us then serve him in fear and all reverence, even as he himself has commanded us, 
and as the apostles who preached the gospel to us and the prophets who proclaimed beforehand the coming of the Lord, Philippians 6. Aeneas 180, for the Lord of all gave to his apostles the power of the gospel through whom also we have known the truth, that is the doctrine of the Son of God against heresies. Um, so, so what we have here, we have scripture that shows us the apostles were to carry and have the authority to carry the eyewitness material about the resurrection. We've seen uh, the early church fathers or attest to that authority. You can have a direct lineal approach mm -hmm. by realizing, for example, that John the Apostle, 95 AD, knew Polycarp, 69 to 155 AD, and who knew Irenaeus, 130 to 200 AD. And so we have clear lineage of the tradition of passing on uh, what the apostles actually said they saw. And you can read X, for example, of Irenaeus talking about Polycarp, uh, which confirms this kind of thing. So I think that pretty much establishes quite clearly why, why it's important to realize the authoritativeness of the four Gospels. So we've looked at quite a lot of information um, that kind of you reflect on what you've just been given. It kind of just absolutely demolishes um, demolishes any criticism that the Gospels are a fabrication. You've been given uh, some very strong um, information there that will help you to just absolutely show that anybody saying anything and we're just going to look at the historical reliability of the Gospels and uh, if you want to read an article, if you type in Craig L. Blomberg, the historical reliability of the Gospels, uh, you will be able to um, you'll be able to read um, the full article. And he writes, quote, a dozen or so non-Christian writers or texts confirm a remarkable number of details in the Gospels about Jesus' life that he was a Jew living in the first third of the first century. Born out of wedlock, a self-styled teacher who became very popular, selected certain menaces in the disciples, disregarded Jewish dietary laws, and ate with a despised and raged certain Jewish leaders, even though believed to be the Messiah by others was crucified by Pontius Pilate, but believed to have been raised from the dead by by some of his followers, who began a fledgling religion that never died out. 
Some might argue that this does not seem like a lot of detail, but in a world in which almost all historical and biographical writing focused on kings, emperors, and military generals, people in institutional positions of religious power, famous philosophers whose schools had long outlived them, and more generally the well-to-do and influential, it's remarkable that Jesus gets mentioned at all by first by first through the third century by first and through to the third century by non-christian writers before the legalization of christianity in the fourth century who would have expected this obscure cru crucified rabbi to produce a following that would one day become the religion adopted by the greatest percentage of the people on earth and he writes archaeology confirms a whole draft raft of details susceptible to artifactual or epigraphic collaboration with the existence of the pool of Siloam, uh, Bethesda in Jerusalem, the later five porticos just at, as John 5 2 describes Pontius Pilate as Pope Pre Prefect of Judea, Roman crucifixion by driving nails through the ankle bones, fishing boats large enough to hold 13 people like Jesus and his 12 disciples, a tomb of Cephas, the probable ossuary bone box of James, brother of Jesus, and so on. And all of these details in the Gospels were once doubted before the archaeological confirmation came forth. So that's on the historical reliability of the uh, four Gospels. You can read that article, which will be uh, any, a little introduction to the subject. So, is there anything else to say? Okay. Um, So we're just going to reflect just for a minute on some thoughts about the four Gospels. Um, and then we're done. And I uh, hope this will be a helpful resource for you. And um, Okay. Question. What um, are the possible dates of the Gospels? Um, most scholars would put most of the Gospels around about either before 
and after 70 AD. Um, definitely John after 70 AD. But I would give dates round right about Matthew 50 to 60 AD, Mark 50 AD, Luke 60 AD, and John uh, 90 AD. Those are the probable dates that I think the Gospels were written. Mark was probably written in Rome. Luke maybe was written in Rome. John at Ephesus and Matthew maybe in Syria. Um, intended readers of the Gospel, uh, the Matthew Gospel has 40 Old Testament quotes and 60 references to prophets. So it's obviously got a Jewish context. The Gospel of Mark is an explanation of Jewish customs for Roman and Gentile. The Gospel of Luke is Greek uh, and to Gentile. And in John you have Greek, Latin and Hebrew mentioned so it's cross-cultural. In Matthew you find that a lot is mentioned about the King of Israel um, and he is the King in Mark, he is the burden obedient servant in Luke he is the son of man the perfect man mm -hmm. and in John he is the divine son of God in Matthew you have a genealogy from Abraham in Mark there is no genealogy in Luke you have the genealogy to Adam and then in John you have the genealogy from God in John chapter 1 verse 1 to 2 In Matthew 28, 18, 20, Jesus is the royal lawgiver. In Mark 16, 16 to 20, it's Jesus is the mighty worker. In Luke 24, verse 44, um, 53, Jesus is the saviour of sinners. And in John chapter 20, verse 20, 31, Jesus is the son of God. The main ideas in the Gospels are in Matthew, it is law and promise. In Mark, it is power and service. In Luke, it is grace and salvation. And in John, it is glory and life. Key verses in each of the Gospels in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 2, to chapter 3 verse 15, 28, sorry, um, I'll just check that, chapter 3, verse 15, and 28, 18, I'll just check, Okay, and then uh, for Mark, the key verse is Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Uh, in Luke, Luke chapter 5, verse 31 to 32, Luke 19, 10. And then in John, we have John chapter 1, verse 10 to 14, John chapter 3, verse 16, John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. Key themes in the Gospel of Matthew are kingdom and righteousness. In Mark, it is the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness. In Luke, it is compassion, sin, prayer, and uh, concern for the poor. In John, it is I am, as in Jesus is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The style of Matthew shows 
a teacher, and there are lengthy organized discourses. Ethical content of fulfilled prophecies. In Mark we see a preacher, we see miracles and it's very evangelistic. In Luke we see parables and travel narratives and discipleship. In John we see a theologian and doctrinal discourses on I am God. The Gospel of John stresses more the deity of Christ and the Synoptic Gospels look at Christ from more of a practical earthly perspective. They all show one Gospel, one life of Jesus, but from different angles. Okay, so we're going to um, finish now with these words. Sorry about this, I'm just trying to Okay, um, these are just some thoughts about the gospel as a whole, and uh, I hope that these make you think, um, and then we're going to close in prayer. St. Augustine says, if you believe what you like in the gospels and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. John Piper says, neither Muslims nor anyone else truly worships the true God if they reject Jesus as he really is in the Gospels. Philip Chaff says, Jesus Christ is the beginning, the middle, and the end of all. In the Gospels, he walks in human form upon the earth and accomplishes the work of redemption. So I'd encourage you to read all about the Gospel, to get your Bible out and read the four Gospels. Learn about the four Gospels and uh, you'll learn much about Jesus 
and who he is. And so may God bless you. And as I've said, I've retired from YouTube. <laughs> and um, I'll be putting this video on private in the morning. And won't be releasing it for some time. So may God bless everybody. And uh, take care.